Okay, as requested, here's your video about the Unit 1 topic questions. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk a little bit about each topic and what you need to be getting from that, and then we'll go through the questions, and uh, I'll talk about why the answers are what they are. So Topic 1.1 .1 is about the structure of water and hydrogen bonding, as you can see on the screen here. And the big thing to know about this one is about the fact that um, it talks about the subunits of biological molecules, which has to do with the monomers, of course, and the order in which those monomers are put together. And also the properties of water, because of water's polarity, it's hydrogen bonding, <clears throat> and why that is beneficial to um, living things on Earth because there are a lot of things like cohesion, adhesion, surface tension, um, polarity of water, and so forth that have a great deal of effect on living things. So here's the first question. Okay. Water and ammonia interact to form hydrogen bonds as represented in the figure. So there you can see a figure of the, of the diagram of the, uh, of the attraction there. Okay. And so the question says, which statement best helps explain the formation of the hydrogen bonds represented in the figure? All right, so oxygen has a partial positive charge and nitrogen has a partial negative charge. We know that to not be true because we know that oxygen is electronegative and has an attraction to electrons, and so it's going to have a partial negative charge. The nitrogen is um, part of an amino group, and it's going to have a partial positive charge, and so that's not the correct answer. The nitrogen has a partial negative charge, and the hydrogen attached to the oxygen has a partial positive charge. Okay, sounds sort of reasonable, sort of reasonable, okay. Uh, C, the hydrogen attached to the oxygen has a partial negative charge, and the nitrogen also has a partial negative charge. Well, we know the hydrogen does not have a negative charge, it has a positive charge. And then the last choice, the nitrogen has a partial positive charge, and the hydrogen attached to the water also has a partial positive charge. So which is the correct answer? The answer is B. The nitrogen actually does have a partial negative charge because of the uh, electronegativity, the relative electronegativity of the nitrogen. It's not quite as electronegative as the oxygen, but it's, it's relatively close there. And the hydrogen has a partial positive charge, and that's, uh, that's why we have an attraction there between, that, between those two parts. Remember that hydrogen bonding is a bond between hydrogen ion, or hydrogen atoms, partially negative, partially positive nitrogen, uh, hydrogen atoms with a negatively charged portion of some other molecule. And so there we have hydrogen bonding between the hydrogen and the nitrogen in this particular instance. All right, next one. Figure one is a diagram of water molecules in the air-water interface at the surface of a pond. So you can see in the diagram, you've got the air there in the water, and it shows the partial positive and negative charges of the water molecules as well as some hydrogen bonding between the water molecules there. Uh, and so it's based on figure one, which of the following best describes how the properties of water at an air-water interface enable an insect to walk on the water's surface. So the property we're looking at here is surface tension. Okay, So uh, A, covalent bonds between the water molecules and the air above provide cohesion, which causes tiny bubbles to form under the feet of the insect. Sounds kind of intriguing. But we know that the water molecules are not covalently bonded to the air, so we can eliminate that response. B, ionic bonds between molecules at the surface of the water provide an electric charge which attracts the feet of the insect, keeping it on the surface. So is there an electric charge at the surface of water? Good question. All right, C, polar covalent bonds between molecules at the surface of the water provide adhesion which supports the weight of the insect. Remember that adhesion means the attraction of, of uh, unlike things for each other, okay? Whereas cohe cohesion is the attraction of like things for each other. And then D, hydrogen bonds between, water, what, between molecules at the surface of the water provide surface tension, which allows the water to surface to deform but not break under the insect. Since we can tell already that this is probably about surface tension, then that's obviously D on that particular question. All right, next one. This goes back to the properties of the monomers, okay? Carbohydrates, glucose, galactose, and fructose have the same chemical formula, but different structural formulas as represented in the figure. 
And there you can see the three molecules relative to each other. Very, very similar, but not identical, even though they have the same molecular, the same molecular formula, C6H12O6. Which of the following statements about glucose, galactose, and fructose is likely true? A, the carbohydrates have the same properties because they have the same number of carbon-hydrogen oxygen atoms. B, the carbohydrates have the same properties because they each have a single carbon-to-oxygen double bond. C, the carbohydrates have different properties because they have different arrangements of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms. And D, the carbohydrates have different properties because they have different numbers of carbon-to-carbon -carbon bonds. So, the first question you have to ask yourself in a question like this is, are the properties the same or are they different? We should know from what we've learned in class and what we've talked about before that the different structure means different function and different properties. So we need to go with the different properties. And so the question is, why are the properties different? Is it because of the different arrangements of the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen? Or is it because they have different numbers of carbon to carbon bonds? The two that are most similar to each other are glucose and galactose. In glucose and galactose, we have different relative positions of the hydroxyl groups and the hydrogens on either side of the central carbons there. And if you count the carbon to carbon bonds, they all have the same number of carbon to carbon bonds. So we can eliminate D and the correct answer is C. All right, the next topic is 1.2, which is elements of life. And this one is talking about the um, exchange of matter within the environment. It's also talking about different types of atoms that are required to build necessary molecules. And it specifically talks about in the essential knowledge statements that carbon is used to build biological molecules, like carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids. And nitrogen is used to build proteins and nucleic acids. Phosphorus is used to build nucleic acids and certain lipid, lipids. So it's talking about the four essential elements of life, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, basically. But it's focusing specifically on carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So let's look at the questions. All right. Which of the following statements best describes how organisms, such as rabbits, obtain the carbon necessary for building biological molecules? Rabbits eat plants and use energy absorbed from the plants to make carbon atoms from electrons, protons, and neutrons in the air. B. Rabbits eat plants and break down plant molecules to obtain carbon and other atoms that they rearrange into new carbon-containing molecules. C. Rabbits eat plants and use water absorbed from the plants to hydrolyze CO2, which the rabbits breathe in from the air and use as a carbon source. D. Rabbits eat plants and make carbon-containing molecules by using carbon atoms that the plants absorbed from the soil and stored in the leaves and the cells of their leaves. All right. So it shows here the plants with starch and the starch molecule, and then there's the rabbit, and then there is a, another molecule there. And if you look at that carefully, you should be able to tell what kind of molecule that is. It is a fatty acid. And so we're using carbohydrates here to make fatty acids. All right. So we know that the energy in A, the energy absorbed from the plants, is not going to make carbon atoms, and we're certainly not using electrons, protons, and neutrons that are floating around in the air to make new uh, atoms. That just doesn't work, okay? Um, we know that, um, that rabbits don't use water absorbed from the plants to hydrolyze CO2 and breathe, in, breathe that in as a carbon source. That's kind of ridiculous, okay? So that boils it down to B and C. Both of those say they, meet, they eat plants. One says they make carbon-containing molecules using carbon atoms from the plants. The other says they break down plant molecules to obtain carbon and other atoms that they rearrange into new carbon-containing molecules. The correct answer is B. I'm hopeful that that would be somewhat obvious to you, just thinking about how life works. All right, next. Students conducted a controlled experiment to investigate whether sawdust provides enough nutrients to support plant growth. The students separated 10 nearly identical sunflower seedlings into two groups. They grew the seedlings in the first group in potting soil 
and seedlings in the second group in sawdust composed mostly of cellulose. After 20 days, the students recorded observations about the seedlings in each group. The students' observations are presented in the table. And here we have seedlings in potting soil grew to a mean seedling height of 18.5 centimeters, and their leaves were dark green and normal in size, whereas the ones in sawdust only grew to 4.8 centimeters, substantially smaller, and they, the leaves have a grayish color and are small in size. And the question, the observed differences between the groups most likely resulted from differences in the ability of the seedlings to produce which of the following monomers? All right, and so you see the pictures of the monomers here. A shows us uh, glycerol and a glucose or some, some monosaccharide sugar, okay? Um, you don't have to know that that's glycerol. You can just tell it, you can tell it's a carbohydrate for sure. That's what glycerol really is. It's an alcohol, which is a carbohydrate, okay? B is some kind of amino acid, and it says this only instead of one, instead of two different things, okay? C shows an amino acid and a nucleic acid, all right? And D shows a nucleic acid and a carbohydrate. So which two things are they going to need from, uh, or, or need from, need from the soil they grow in to make certain kinds of molecules? Well, if you think about it carefully, the thing that they're really missing there in sawdust, they've got lots of cellulose, but they don't have any other nutrients, okay? So the answer is going to be the amino acids and the nucleic acids, because those both require nitrogen, and nitrogen is not going to be present in the cellulose that they're in from, from the sawdust. All right, next we have a figure that shows a model of the exchange of matter between organisms that live in an aquarium. The model includes matter exchange between plants, fish, and bacteria. The bacteria are represented as rod-shaped organisms living in the gravel at the bottom of the aquarium. You can see them down there, and their role that they play in this little ecosystem. Okay, Which of the following statements best describes how molecules released by the fish become nutrients for the plants? The carbon dioxide molecules released by the fish are converted by the bacteria to oxygen atoms, which are used by the plants to make the water molecules. B, the oxygen molecules released by the fish are converted by the bacteria to ammonia molecules, which are used by the plants to make the lipids and fatty acids. C, the nitrites released by the fish are converted by the bacteria to carbon dioxide molecules, which are used by the plants to make carbohydrates. D, the ammonia molecules released by the fish are converted by bacteria to nitrates, which are used by the plants to make proteins and nucleic acids. The only one that makes sense, according to the diagram, is D, the ammonia molecules that the fish releases in its urinary product, okay, are converted by the bacteria to nitrates, you can see the arrow directly to the nitrates, which are used by the plants to make proteins and nucleic acids, okay, and so that's kind of the obvious answer there if you look carefully at the diagram. Our next topic is about introduction. To, this is the introduction to biological macromolecules, and this one's pretty much specifically about hydrolysis and dehydration synthesis. Okay, notice the exclusion statements here. It says the molecular structure of specific nucleotides and amino acids is beyond the scope of the AP exam, which is why I've said I don't expect you to be able to recognize them when you see them, because that's not something that we are going to test for on the AP exam. The other exclusion statement says the molecular structure of specific carbohydrate polymers is beyond the scope of the AP exam. And again, I'm not asking you to identify them. I'm just asking you to recognize that they belong to that group. That's the important thing there. All right. Sorry about that. Let me go back. Okay. Which of the following best describes the formation of the bond shown in figure one? So here we have a, a diagram showing this reaction occurring here. Okay. So... A, an ionic bond is formed between a carbon atom of one amino acid and a nitrogen atom of another. B, an ionic bond is formed when the negative charge of a hydroxyl group is balanced by the positive charge of a hydrogen ion. C, a covalent bond is formed between a carbon atom and a nitrogen atom along with the formation of water. And D, a covalent bond is formed that replaces the hydrogen bond between the OH group and the H atom. Okay. I am hopeful at this point in time that you can recognize that the way the 
drawings are drawn shows that they're definitely covalent bonds, so we can eliminate the responses A and B. The question is, is that um, going to form a covalent bond and make water, or is it going to form a covalent bond and replace the hydrogen bond between the hydroxyl and the hydrogen atom? And the answer, I hope you recognize, is C. Okay, next, figure one represents a common process that occurs in organisms. So similar picture, okay, to what we saw the last time. One small addition there. Which of the following is an accurate description of the process shown in figure one? The linking of amino acids with an ionic bond is an initial step in protein synthesis. The formation of a more complex carbohydrate with covalent bonding of two simple sugars. The hydrolysis of amino acids with the breaking of covalent bonds in the release of water. D, the formation of a covalent pep peptide bond in a dehydration synthesis reaction. And hopefully you can recognize that the answer is D because there you see the removal of a water molecule to combine the two molecules together, which is what the definition of dehydration synthesis is. Third one, polypeptides are continuously being formed and degraded. One of these processes is shown. Okay, so there's a polypeptide, and here you see the breaking of the polypeptide. Which statement is the most accurate description of the reaction shown in figure one? A, it represents monomers linked by dehydration synthesis. B, it represents a polypeptide chain that folds to form a tertiary structure. C, it represents a polypeptide chain that is denatured into the primary structure. D, it represents a polypeptide chain that is broken down through a hydrolysis reaction. And since we're putting water back in here and we're splitting it apart, that lets us know that it is D, a uh, hydrolysis reaction. Please note that you should be able to recognize that that is a polypeptide without being told. Look for the carbon to nitrogen to carbon carbon bonds, okay? Uh, throughout, the, throughout this whole thing here, here you see carbon to carbon to nitrogen to carbon to carbon to nitrogen and so forth. You see the R groups there. You see the, you see the carbonyl groups on the carbon. The amino groups present there that should give you a big hint that that is going to be a polypeptide with all those peptide bonds okay <coughs> the next topic <coughs> excuse me is uh, 1.4 which is properties of biological macromolecules and this one deals with the structure and function of polymers and the way the monomers are assembled in those okay so we've got nucleic acids talking about the fact that the information is encoded in the sequence of nucleotides, the structure of a nucleotide, which is the five carbon sugar, the phosphate, and the nitrogen base, the difference in structure between DNA and RNA, in protein, the order of the amino acids in a polypeptide, which is the primary structure, and that the amino acids have directionality with the amino terminus and the carboxyl terminus, the R group, is characterized by chemical properties that we've been looking at in class. And the interactions of the R groups determine structure and function of that part of the protein. Complex carbohydrates are sugar monomers. Structures determine the properties and functions of the molecules. And lipids are nonpolar macromolecules uh, with differences in saturation, like the unsaturated and, and saturated fatty acids, okay? And that phospholipids contain polar regions that interact with polar molecules and nonpolar regions that are often hydrophobic. The exclusion statement here says the molecular structure of specific liquid lipids is beyond the scope of the AP exam. So in other words, you should be able to recognize that a lipid is a lipid, including a steroid, but you don't have to know which steroid in the picture is testosterone or, or, or um, estrogen or whatever else. Okay, just you recognize that it is a lipid. That's really important to understand, okay? All right, here we go. Molecular structure of linoleic acid and palmitic acid, two naturally occurring substances, are shown in the figure. Based on the molecular structure shown in the figure, which molecule is likely to be solid at room temperature? Okay, A, lin linoleic acid, because the absence of carbon-to-carbon -carbon double bonds <coughs> allows the molecules to pack closely together. B, linoleic acid, because the presence of carbon-to-carbon -carbon double bonds prevents the molecules from packing closely together. C, palmitic acid, because the absence of carbon-to-carbon -carbon double bonds allows the molecules to pack closely together. 
and D, palmitic acid, because the presence of carbon to carbon double bonds prevents the molecules from packing closely together. So we talked about this before. The reason saturated fats are solids at room temperature is because they are lacking double bonds between carbons, and therefore they have straight chains that can pack closely together. So the answer is C, the absence of double bonds that allows the molecules to pack closely together. Which of the following best describes the structure of carbohydrates? A, they only occur as disaccharides. B, they occur as monomers, chains of monomers, and branched structures. C, they only occur as long branch structures. D, they occur as chains of monomers that hydrogen bond with complementary chains of monomers. So the answer to that one is B, they occur as monomers, chains of monomers, and branched structures. The branched structures are things like glycogen and um, certain kinds of plant starch. Okay. All right, next, which of the following best describes how amino acids affect the tertiary structure of a protein? A, the number of amino acids determines the tertiary structure of the protein. B, the interactions of the different R groups with other R groups and with their environment determine the tertiary structure of the protein. C, the R group of the last amino acid that is added to the growing chain determines the next amino acid that's added to the chain. And D, the sequence of amino acids in the polypeptide chain determines the protein's primary structure but has no effect on its tertiary structure. So A and C don't make much sense, okay? So we'll look at B and D. The big thing here is to realize that the sequence of the amino acids does determine the interactions of the different R groups because the R groups are based on the specific amino acids. So in that case, the answer has to be B. All right, topic 1.5 is about structure and function of biological macromolecules, and that has to do mostly with DNA and proteins, okay? Directionality of the subcomponents influences the structure and function of the polymer. We didn't talk a whole lot about this. We'll talk more about it later on. But basically, nucleic acids have that linear sequence that's defined by the 3' prime hydroxyl group and the 5' prime phosphates of the sugar in the nucleotides. Okay, and the nucleotides are added to the 3' prime end of the growing strand, resulting in the formation of a covalent bond between the nucleotides. You won't be asked any questions about specific DNA replication in this test. You will later on, all right? But this tells you there's specific directionality in the way the polymer forms. DNA is structured as anti-parallel double helix, and so we, said, you know, we talked about that, and the fact that the strands run in opposite 5' prime to 3' prime orientation. And adenine always pairs with thymine, cytosine always pairs with guanine, and cytosine and guanine have three hydrogen bonds. Adenine and thymine have two hydrogen bonds. And that's important. That is important to know. Proteins are made of linear chains of amino acids that are connected by the covalent bonds that we call peptide bonds. Okay. They have a primary structure that is the sequence of the amino acids. Secondary structure because of the local folding of the amino acid into the alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. The tertiary structure that is the overall three-dimensional shape of the protein minimizes free energy, means it gets in a position where it uses less energy. And then quaternary structure that occurs when you have interactions between multiple polypeptide units. And those four things determine the function of the protein. Proteins are not functional until they reach at least the third level, the tertiary level. And then finally, carbohydrates compose linear chains of sugar monomers connected by covalent bonds. They may be linear or branched. Okay, so now we're going to look at some specific things about structure and function of these molecules. All right, this is a specific one. The CFTR protein is made of 1,480 amino acids linked together in a chain. Some humans produce a version of the CFTR protein in which phenylalanine, an amino acid, has been deleted from position 508 of the amino acid chain. Which of the following best predicts how the amino acid deletion will affect the structure of the CFTR protein? So you don't have to know that phenylalanine is a nonpolar amino acid, but it is. Okay. All right, it will have no observable effect on the structure of the CFTR protein. B, it will affect the primary structure of the CFTR protein 
but other levels of protein structure will not be affected. C, it will affect the secondary and tertiary structures of the CFTR protein, but the primary structure will not be affected. D, it will affect primary, secondary, and tertiary structures of the CFTR protein. So the question is, which one's correct? All right, you know that by deleting an amino acid, that we are definitely changing the primary structure. So we can eliminate any answer that doesn't refer to the primary structure. Okay, that would be we we'll eliminate A and C. So the question is, does it only affect the primary structure, or does it also affect the secondary and tertiary structures? And the answer to that question is D. It will affect all three, okay? It affects the primary structure because you've eliminated one of the amino acids. It affects the secondary structure because by eliminating one of the amino acids, that's going to change the way that the carbon-nitrogen backbone chain re um, twists and folds in relation to the amino acids that are there. And the tertiary structure because of the different interactions between the R groups since that R group is not now present. All right. Next, researchers compared similar proteins from related organisms in different habitats. They found that the proteins from organisms living in harsh environments had a greater number of cysteine amino acids than did proteins from organisms not living in harsh environments. The structure of cysteine is shown. Bonds can form between a sulfur atom of different cysteine amino acids forming SS bonds. All right, we call that a disulfide bridge. Which of the following best describes the greater number, the effect of a greater number of cysteine amino acids for the stability of the proteins? A, the change has no effect on the stability of the protein because only, because the only, because only one type of amino acid is involved. B, the change leads to increased protein stability because of an increased number of SS bonds in the tertiary structure. C, the change leads to decreased protein stability because of an increased number of SS bonds in the tertiary structure. And D, the change leads to increased protein stability only when added cysteine amino acids are next to each other, next to other cysteine amino acids in the primary structure. All right, from the lab that you did we, with the protein structure, you should know we can eliminate A right away, okay? And we can eliminate D right away because you know it doesn't have to be when they're right next to each other. So those, self those disulfide bonds... Those disulfide bridges are really important to maintain stability. As you can see, that might really have a strong effect on uh, whether a plant can, um, or an organism, can survive a harsh environment. If the, if the environment's harsh, then you want the proteins to be more stable. If, you're, if you have a mild uh, environment, then the stability is less of a problem because you don't have extremes, okay? So the question is, is it increased stability because of the number of, of SS bonds, or is it decreased stability because of the increased number? And obviously the stability, if you remember, we put the little extra handcuff structure holding those two together with a, dot, with a, with a covalent bond. That's definitely going to increase the stability of the protein. So the answer to this one is B. All right, here's, here's a mutated protein. Talking about each protein structure. A small protein is composed of 110 amino acids linked together in a chain. As shown in figure one, the first and last five amino acids in the chain are hydrophobic. They have nonpolar and uncharged R groups. Whereas the remaining 100 amino acids are hydrophilic, have charged or polar R groups. The nature of the R group determines the amino acid is hydrophobic or hydrophilic. A mutation results in the production of a version of the small protein that is only 105 amino acids long, as shown in figure 2. Five of the hydrophobic amino acids are missing from one end of the chain. Which of the following best depicts the tertiary structure of the two properties in water? The diagrams in the, in the options are not drawn to the same scale as those in figure 1 and figure 2. So, look at the look at the two look at the four examples here. So in the A, the original protein, there's not a whole lot of difference in the shape of that except for this one little part that's right up here at the top. Okay. In B, the original protein has two parts that are sticking out to the side here, whereas the mutated protein has only one sticking out. 
and C, the original protein and the mutated protein don't look all that different from each other. And in D, the original protein is a circle and the mutated is a circle with a little part sticking up there. So the question is which one is right? So what's happening? We're removing the hydrophobic amino acids from the carboxyl terminus of the structure. Okay? The, um, the hydrophobic part, remember, is going to be non, basically nonpolar. It's going to try to stay away from the watery environment of the cell, whereas the hydrophilic part is going to try to stick out. And so something that has something sticking out. So the question is, so you've got something sticking out on A and something st sticking out on B and D. We can eliminate C, of course, okay? So is it going to be a circle with all those hydrophilic amino acids there in the circle? Is it going to be a globular protein with a long chain sticking out of it or one with a, with a, with a short chain sticking out of it? And the answer to this one is A, okay? The only part that's going to be sticking out right up here at the top is this little part right here. The rest of it's going to be tightly packed together so those hydrophobic R groups can be clustered on the inside of the, of the cluster. All right, topic 1.6 is about nucleic acids specifically, and it's talking about the structural similarities between RNA and DNA. The things they have in common are the sugar, the phosphate group, and the nitrogen base, that linear molecules with 5' prime and 3' prime ends, the nitrogen bases are perpendicular to the sugar phosphate backbone. That's the basic structure there. Okay? The differences are DNA contains deoxyribose and RNA contains ribose. RNA contains uracil and DNA contains thymine instead. DNA is usually double-stranded. RNA is usually single-stranded. And the two DNA strands are, in double-stranded DNA are anti-parallel in directionality. That is not always the case in RNA. So, Questions. Figure 1 represents a nucleic acid fragment that is made up of four nucleotides linked together in a chain. You can see that here. Okay. Which of the following characteristics of figure 1 best shows that the fragment is RNA and not DNA? Okay, so we can look here and see that. What do we got? What's going to show? It's got the 5' prime to 3' prime orientation. Okay. It shows the 3' prime end here, 5' prime end up here. We've got the identity of the nitrogen bases. Does it tell us what the nitrogen bases are? No, it does not. And we don't have to know by looking at them what they are other than pyrimidines, these two, and purines, these two. Okay. The charges on the phosphate groups. So the charges on the phosphate groups are always going to be negative. And the bonds linking them together are there. So what's, what's the showing that this is RNA and not DNA? The fact that it's got different nitrogenous bases. Now, how are we supposed to know that? I can't really tell you. What I can tell by looking at it, that it's RNA, is because of the presence of this right here on the number 2 carbon. Okay, That hydroxyl group there is present only in, R in, in ribose sugar. Deoxyribose doesn't have that oxygen there. And so that's what I see is the difference, even though the the answer key says it's the nitrogenous base. If you had to know what those nitrogenous bases were, then that would be a valid answer. I don't think this is a very good question, but it's one of the ones they have on there, and that's what that's the reason I would say that it's RNA is because of the presence of that hydroxyl group on the number two carbon. Um, but not I couldn't identify what those nitrogen bases were other than purines and pyrimidines. Obviously, one of them is probably uracil probably this one up here, but I'm not 100% sure. I don't know about that one. All right. DNA and RNA are nucleic acids that can be stored by logical information based on the sequence of their nucleotide monomers. Figure 1 shows a short segment of each of the two types, two main types of nucleic acids. Okay. Which of the following best describes the structural difference between DNA and RNA? A. DNA contains four types of nitrogen bases where RNA contains only two. B, the backbone of DNA contains deoxyribose, while the backbone of RNA contains ribose. C, a DNA molecule is composed of two parallel strands with the same 5 to 3 prime directionality, whereas an RNA molecule is composed only of one strand. 
D phosphate groups provide rigidity to DNA, but RNA is flexible and contains no phosphates. Okay, so we're looking for a structural difference, and that has to do with how it's put together. So RNA does contain ribose in the backbone, and DNA contains deoxyribose. That's true. DNA is composed of two parallel strands with the same directionality. Is that correct? They have opposite directionality, so that makes B the correct answer. All right, one more. Which of the following conclusions is most clearly supported by the representation of nucleic acid number one and number two? So look at the nucleic acids there. It's got the structure of the, nucle of the bases. It shows you the color key, color-coded key for what the bases are, okay? A says nucleic acid number one contains only purines, whereas nucleic acid number two contains only pyrimidines. So the pyrimidines are cytosine and uracil and thymine, okay? And the purines are adenine and guanine. I see uracil, I see cytosine, but I also see adenine and guanine in the nucleic acid number two, and I see uh, guanine, adenine, cytosine, and thymine in nucleic acid number one. All right, now B, nucleic acid number one contains the ribose, whereas nucleic acid number two contains the sugar deoxyribose. Can you tell that from looking at the pictures? You know that to be true for DNA and RNA, but can you tell it from the picture that's going to show here? I don't think you can, because it doesn't show the sugars. Okay. C, nucleic acid number one contains positively charged phosphate groups, whereas nucleic acid number two does not. Are phosphate groups ever positively charged? Not to my knowledge. D, nucleic acid number one contains adenine thymine base pairs, whereas nucleic acid number two does not. And I would say D is the correct answer there because of that. All right. That's all the topic questions for this time. There's one, there's, well, there's one more topic question that was a free response question. And so I think this one's a really good one for you to practice on before your test. Um, I think it'll be helpful to you. So here's the question. You ready? The diagram shows water molecules as solid ice at 0 degrees Celsius and as liquid at 25 degrees Celsius. A says describe why hydrogen bonds form between the molecules. You should be able to describe why that happens. That is not, uh, that is not something that should be unknown to you. Be sure to look at the task verbs and see what describe means, because that's what you're expected to do. B says explain why the arrangement of water molecules is different in ice and water. And again, you should be able to de describe that. If you don't think you can describe that <coughs> adequately, then go back and look in chapter 1, where it talks, or the 2, 1, where it talks about the water, okay? and about the arrangement of the molecules. C, to help explain surface tension, use single water molecule in a template over down to the left and draw arrows representing the possible locations of hydrogen bonds formed by the molecule. Okay, it shows you the template there. And then the possible hydrogen bonds formed by a water molecule below the surface are shown. So we're looking at hydrogen bonds um, at the surface, okay. And then D, the arrangement of the water molecules in ice causes the ice to float. Explain how ice floating on the surface of the body of water affects the water in a way that is beneficial to the organisms in it. That is an important thing to be able to explain. And again, if you need to go back to chapter one <coughs> and look at the part about water and about why uh, waters, the properties of water that make it beneficial to living things, then I think you'll find that answer. Try to answer it without doing that. If you have questions, let me know. See ya.